Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Coming up, relief for schools with too many snow days, expansion of early childhood education scholarships, an in-depth look at our state's budget forecast, and Governor Walls signs his first two bills. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. As hardy Minnesotans, we're hopefully managing this difficult winter, but it has taken a toll on our schools. Districts have had to cancel classes due to extreme cold and big snowstorms, causing consternation for school boards who have to meet a standard number of days to receive full funding. Senator Carla Nelson, chair of the E-12 Education Committee, has a bill that would address the attendance shortfall, and she joins me now. Thanks for coming. Great to be here, Shannon. Your bill, the Snow Day Relief Act, would allow school districts to shorten their calendar for this year only. Why not just tack those extra days on during spring break or at the end of the year? Well, there's several reasons. Uh, one has to do with the quantity of days. Some school districts have already had to uh, call off school 10 times. Uh, and the snow is so severe there that uh, they have roofs that are collapsing. So now that it's not snowing, yet the kids can't get into the school buildings because the roofs are collapsing or we have barns that are collapsing. So the point is there's been so many snow days that it would really require an additional two weeks. And why can't we tack that on to the end of the school calendar? There's a number of reasons. One, graduation. Uh, two, uh, jobs, summer jobs, uh, summer school. And then, of course, schools have construction during the summer months. Those are already planned out with the day after the kids leave, the construction crews come in, they have so many days to finish the project, and then it's time for school in the fall. So there's a host of reasons why it can't be tacked on at the end. But let me just tell you, as a former middle school teacher, I can tell you that there's not a whole lot of learning that goes on <laughs> after Memorial Day. <laughs> that's true, that's true. So this would allow school districts to decide for themselves that they want to shorten their calendar for this year only. Is that right? Yes, it's very limited this year only. And most importantly, it's by a board resolution. So the boards need to vote on whether or not they're going to shorten that calendar for this year. Uh, this has been a tough winter. What if this is the new normal? Do schools need to build more flexibility into their schedules so that this maybe doesn't happen again? Well, yes, and many schools do build flexibility in with a number of snow days or e-learning days. We can talk about that. No one's ever foreseen, though, that there would be 10 snow days. And I will just say, in my neck of the woods, there's more snow coming again this weekend. Uh, so, and it's not that we are against snow. It's just that there's so much of it that you can't transport kids safely. And what I would say, talking to superintendents, uh, they will often say this is the hardest decision they have to make, which is hard to believe with all their hard decisions. But the fact of the matter is there's this tension between keeping uh, kids and staff from unsafe travel conditions and needing to make this calendar a deadline for how many days we have. So I hope it's not the new normal. Uh, this is unprecedented, record setting in every area. That's why there's this one year reprieve. Now you mentioned e-learning and some school districts already do this. I believe they're limited to five, but students mm -hmm. can work from home. Um, is this an option going forward, building more e-learning, though what do you do with students who maybe don't have broadband, Wi-Fi, or the computer equipment that they need? Yes, uh, you've encapsulated the problem succinctly. Um, and so this legislation also does require, though, a school district to report to the commissioner how many days it shortened its calendar. And if they took advantage of this uh, reprieve from the calendar requirement, they are strongly encouraged to consider e-learning days. And I think we'll know more after this year if we should remove that cap or maybe expand it to from five days maybe to seven or eight. We just don't know yet. Uh, but we do live in a digital world where a lot of learning does take place digitally. A lot of work takes place digitally. And so we want to make sure our kids have that availability too. Uh, but they need to have the uh, technology, both the hardware and the, so and the uh, Wi-Fi as well. And so that's something that uh, our schools are building out. Each year I get a report about high-speed internet, internet access in our schools and our districts. So we'll have to continue to work on that broadband issue. What is the worst case scenario if the legislature doesn't pass a solution for this year? Well, I've had a couple superintendents tell me about that. Uh, their worst fear is that if we don't pass any relief, that the next snowstorm, which we're not even to basketball tournaments yet, we usually get some weather there, um, that they'll be, they're fearful that superintendents will be weighing this fact that 
we've got, we can't make up the days, there's too many of them, yet we have to have 165 days, and they're fearful that maybe some decisions would be made that would truly endanger students and staff as far as having them on the roads when they ought not be. And uh, you might recall last year, I think it was here in the cities, there was a young boy who, a kindergartner, who didn't get off the bus until after midnight one night because it, the roads were so treacherous getting home. So while it might seem maybe okay uh, at 4 a.m. when that call is made to cancel school, you know, you've got to think about getting the kids home in the That's afternoon true. too. Uh, there is a House version of the bill that would just simply uh, remove the polar vortex days in late January. Um, your bill is to change the calendar. What's the, what's the differences? What absolutely mm. must be done? Well, I think the real difference is whether it's a statewide one-size-fits-all or if it's a local decision. So I firmly believe our districts are entirely different as far as what the weather has done to them, their school calendar, how many days they have, how many ways they've had to make it up. And I just am a firm believer in that local control with accountability, of course, which is the voters, uh, because the school board has to vote on that shortened calendar. And then the transparency in reporting to the commissioner how many days they shortened their calendar. And the thing that I think parents want to know, uh, certainly I want to know as the policy and finance chair, is, well, are our kids still gonna learn the same amount of stuff? Uh, and the standards don't change. We're not changing the standards, we're not lowering that at all. We're just saying that uh, kids are going to have to uh, cover and this amount of information, know it, uh, with maybe a day or less, two of school. Okay, let's turn uh, to early learning scholarships because you have a bill with bipartisan support that would expand these early learning scholarships. When did they first become available and why the need for expansion now? Uh, these scholarships started out as the MELF bill, the Minnesota Early Learning Foundation. It was in 2011. Uh, it was a bill that I was a co-sponsor on uh, and quite frankly it was a former Senator Dwayne Benson who was really on the vanguard of how important it is that our kids enter kindergarten ready to learn and that needs to be uh, through some high quality preschool education. It could be at home, it could be at a family child care, it could be at a school child care, it could be at a day at a center or at school based uh, child care. But the point is what happens during that child care and are we using kindergarten readiness standards uh, for uh, teaching those kids. And so these have been popular and there is a need for expansion just because of the need for them? Uh, well yes, the need continues to grow and there's something else that continues to grow or that we cannot reduce and that's our persistent achievement gap. And the early learning scholarships have shown great success in helping kids enter kindergarten ready to learn, become those great third grade readers, and then continue on with a school and success in life. So um, because we have such a persistent achievement gap, number one, these scholarships are targeted. So the money, the scholarships go to children whose parents would not be able to afford a preschool education. Now, some parents are aware and are advocating for their children. There are other parents, for whatever reason, who are not able, are not aware. How do you address those disparities for the kids who don't have anyone advocating or looking for that early learning readiness that all kids need? Yes, and all parents want to know, quite frankly. And that's why we have the uh, child aware, the parent aware, uh, which actually uh, rates different uh, child care facilities, homes, uh, settings, as far as are they preparing kids for kindergarten? Where are they on that road to being a child care facility that is actually preparing kids for kindergarten? One last question. We have a child care shortage in Minnesota, and many of these scholarships presumably go to centers that have this preschool per curriculum. Will there be enough spots if there's more scholarships? Will parents be able to find good spots for their kids? Yes, and the scholarships actually go to parents who can use them at any site. That's the beauty of the scholarship. They can use them at a center, they can use them at a school uh, child care facility, they can use them at a family child care facility, church. So there's a variety, it's called a mixed delivery model. That's part of the beauty and the success of the Minnesota model that's now being copied really around the nation. Uh, targeted resources to parents at need with a mixed delivery model that they can use at any setting. And that's why it will better protect the uh, child, care, uh, child care crisis. It will help eliminate that. If in fact we took all of our four-year-olds and put them into the public schools, that would totally exacerbate the child care crisis because it would be totally unaffordable for uh, the three, two, one and babies. 
Senator Nelson, thank you so much. Yeah, wonderful. Good to be here. This week, Governor Walls signed his first two bills into law at a signing ceremony in the governor's reception room. This is an exciting day, and I'll just uh, own this candidly. It'll be the first uh, bill that I get to sign as the, the 41st governor of Minnesota. Uh, it's doing the people's work, and I'd just like to take a couple minutes to talk about what ended up here. I know there was a, a, a somewhat of an informal lottery of what would be the first bill that ended up here, distracted driving, voting, uh, or this. Uh, and these two pieces of legislation today, while I think if you look from the outside and you weren't following this, may not seem like they would have been the high profile things that came here, but this is the hard work of governance. This is the stuff that impacts people's tax dollars in a fairly significant manner, and it impacts the experience they have with government and the expectations they have out of government. Whether it's the ability to walk in and get a driver's license in a timely manner, or whether it's to work collectively together to take care of a toxic landfill in Andover that impacts all of us. As we look to May, this is what I want it to look like. But you have uh, Democrats and Republicans, the governor, the speaker, myself, and, and leaders from both bodies, both sides of the aisle, are here saying we got it done, we got it done on time, and it's something that we all can be proud of. And this is that first step. Uh, this, the Minlars bill and the, def the bonding bill that had projects from, from water to roads in it were very, very important to get done and get off the table. I appreciate that the governor engaged early, uh, said what he was willing to do, took responsibility, but frankly, we acknowledge that we all take responsibility here because it's in Minnesota's best interest. And so it was give and take. Uh, but having these two bills going forward as the first and second bill really is important for Minnesota. It shows that we can, as the only divided government uh, in the United States, actually function in a way that's good for Minnesota. So We're really pleased that the governor has really stepped forward on the Minnesota uh, licensing project and taken full responsibility for doing what we need to do to get things right. And at the legislature, we're partnering with the governor on this. And I know uh, the Republican Senate in particular uh, has no desire to spend any more money on Minlars ever. But we do need the system to work for Minnesotans. And so to, in order to get that done, we had to uh, bundle some other things with it. And we had a couple of impasse moments, but we kept working in a respectful manner to get past those impasse moments. The numbers are out. The February budget and economic forecast, which guides lawmakers' state budgeting process, has weakened since November. Dr. Laura Kalimbakitis, the state economist, joins me to talk about what's driving slower growth. Welcome. Thank you. The February forecast projects one-third less surplus than the last forecast. Mm -hmm. So we're, we have $1 billion down from the $1.5 billion that was forecast in November. Governor Walls described the burst in the economy following the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act as a sugar high. Is he right that the slowing down is partly due to the effects of the tax stimulus wearing off? Yes, that's one of the reasons that the macro forecasters are citing for um, slower economic growth going forward. So from, from higher growth in 18 and 19 to slower growth later in our planning horizon. So another way to think about that is that in the absence of the federal fiscal stimulus, we would have had slower growth sooner. And so the federal fiscal stimulus sort of kept that slowdown from happening uh, earlier. So it kept a burst of energy going just a little bit longer than maybe it would have naturally yeah, slowed right. down on its own. Yeah. Okay. The Star Tribune editorial board advocated caution in response to this most recent forecast. However, the economy is expected to grow mm -hmm. just at a slower pace. Mm -hmm. This is good news, right? It is good news. It's better news than the economy not growing. Um, you know, so we're always worried about a recession and what that means, and we don't have a recession in this forecast. A recession isn't the only kind of challenge that we might face, though. So a period of slower growth is another kind of challenge. And so we uh, talked about how while the economy is growing more slowly, revenues are growing more slowly, too. And because the budget has to be balanced for the state of Minnesota, that means expenditures are going to have to grow more slowly. And so that creates its own set of opportunities and challenges. One reason cited for the weakened projections is less revenue coming into the state, weakness in income tax withholding, smaller job gains, and lower wage growth, income wage growth. 
What could be causing this? So the slower employment growth um, is something that could be a result of slower labor force growth in Minnesota. So this is something that's long been projected, that our labor force growth is slowing because of the aging of the population. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so what it looks like now is that that slower labor force growth is constraining our ability to add jobs because you don't get to add count a job as added until you actually have somebody in it. And so having slower sort of the uh, tightening of supply. While demand for labor is very high, we have this slower labor force growth. And so that slower employment growth fed into our forecast for the growth in total incomes earned by workers. The tightening labor market, as you were just mentioning, uh, is cited as a drain on the state's economic growth. <clears throat> this week before the Senate Finance Committee, Neil Kashkari, who's president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank, said that he believes that there is still slack in the labor market because wage growth remains slow. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with his assessment? Yeah, I think um, that uh, Mr. Kashkari was talking about the U.S. labor market and how he, you know, he has a view to the whole region and to the, uh, the whole country and how um, we're still seeing, even as unemployment gets falls in, in the United States, we're still seeing people enter the labor market. Um, and that's keeping wage growth, that can be one of the elements, it's keeping wage growth slow. Um, in Minnesota, we have a higher labor force participation rate than in most states and than in the United States. And so it's actually a pretty high labor force participation rate given the demographics that we have. So while there might still be some slack in Minnesota's labor market, there might be, still be some people on the sidelines that, that higher wage growth will pull them in, uh, it's not, we don't have as much slack, we don't have as a deep a bench as there might be in other states. If wages do begin to rise, signaling full employment and competition for workers, how would that affect Minnesota's economy? Yeah, so nationally what full employment means is that you're at a level of unemployment where if you go any lower, it can spur inflation. So nationally, uh, having, the, you know, having demand for labor increase when you're at full employment can cause inflation. Now Minnesota, we can't cause inflation all by ourselves. We're just one state. And so what we, what we th expect to happen and what's in our forecast is that we expect that the, the, of the total wage growth that we're going to see going forward, so looking at the growth in all of the payrolls of all the employers in the state of Minnesota, more of that growth is going to be, cut, be because of higher earnings per worker and less of it is going to be because of new people being hired and new jobs being added. So that employment growth is constrained by labor force. But as fewer people are, are, fewer jobs are being added, the people who are being added are, will be paid higher wages. Now, how would immigration play into this? If we got an influx of workers from other areas, would that help Minnesota's economy? Yes, it would. So what we have is tight labor supply. And so anything that loosens up that labor supply can help us grow faster. And so that could come from workers from other countries, or it could come from people from other states. And we've seen data from the last two years that um, on net, Minnesota has started gaining uh, people from other states. Our net domestic in migration has been positive in 17 and 18, and that reverses a 15-year trend of our net domestic immigration being negative. So that's a bright spot for Minnesota, and another potential bright spot would be uh, additions to international immigration. Our, we're talking a lot about labor and mm -hmm. wages. Yeah. That seems to be one of the big takeaways from this forecast. But are there sectors of the economy, which we've talked about in the past, that are doing really well that should be noted? Yeah, so we continue to have um, growth in the, in healthcare services and professional services, that tight labor market is being felt in places like, or in sectors like construction. So construction, you know, I think is being constrained by that tight labor market, but there's plenty of demand. And so if we do get some loosening of the labor market, that sector can grow. Um, we've seen challenges with regard to um, manufacturing and uh, all of our export sectors, including natural resource exports, um, and manufacturing having having challenges due to um, U.S. tariffs and retaliatory tariffs on our on our exports, but manufactured goods are still doing our, our, our manufactured exports are still doing okay. What will it take for the agricultural commodity prices to turn around? Yeah, so the reason that they're low and they, they're falling off really high peaks of um, 12, 13, 14, the reason that they're low now is because global demand has fallen. 
Um, China, while China still is growing you know, faster than many other economies, it's growing more slowly than it was. And so its demand for soybeans, for instance, is less than it was. Um, another thing that has happened is that um, supply of agricultural commodities has increased over time. And, you know, farmers just can't stop producing higher yields. You know, they just keep doing better and better and better. And that increased supply um, has dampening effects on prices. So what would turn it around? Well, the best thing that could happen that could turn it around would be increased global growth. So you wouldn't want to say, well, gosh, some drought somewhere, that would help. But that's, you know, that's, not, that's not something we hope for. But increased demand would help. Dr. Kolomakitis, we have to leave it there. But thank you so much. I always enjoy it when you're here. Thank you. In our occasional series, The People's House, we highlight various aspects of our beautiful state capitol. Here's a look at an exhibit on display through April. As part of the capitol renovation, the third floor east wing has been opened up with spaces for the public, including this gallery space. The current exhibit, Sleeping Giant, is a collection of images from the Iron Range by photographer Vance Gillert, who is joining me here. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. What was the impetus behind this collection? Way back in 2003, I was waiting to interview an artist, and I was driving around by um, Grand Rapids, and I found the coal rain mines, and I thought, what is this? It was beautiful, uh, the various uh, buildings that remained, and I thought, I have to come back and do this. It was the visual beauty of it that started this whole thing. The, you know, they call them uh, low-grade stockpiles of hematite, you know, just like a, a little mountain range that runs up from Grand Rapids to, to actually Babbitt, I think is the furthest northeast end, and these beautiful vermilion pits with the blue water in the bottom. They were just automatically something to photograph. So you said the landscape drew you, and then you spent about two years photographing it. What are you hoping, what, what about the Iron Range captured your attention? Well, it's like any photographic project. You, you get attracted to it, and you realize it is a big story that I'd like to tell, and then I sort of follow it. It really, I don't have a plan. I go up and discover. I talk to people. I l drive around and look at things, and, and uh, people recommend people that I should talk to, and it just develops. So in addition to the landscape, though, there's also, you wrote about the 43 nationalities who lived in this area and inhabited this area, worked in these mines, and all the different cultures that are represented. How did you convey that through these pictures? And that was fascinating how that all evolved. And in a way, there's a lot of uh, cultural uh, competition, maybe a little animosity, you know, which bars you could go to. But it was a classic way of getting labor. It always has been. They blanketed Europe and other places with leaflets, come to northern Minnesota, and the streets are paved with gold. So you also cover a little bit the first people, the Ojibwe people who were here, who, who are the title of this exhibit, The Sleeping Giant. Right. Uh, well, I thought when I was doing the project, as I was going along, I thought, I haven't got a Native perspective. I mean, they were here first. And we came in first, we cut down virtually every pine that was there, and then we kind of ripping these holes in the ground. And so I you know, found my way to actually a Boys Fort Reservation up in, uh, it's near uh, Lake Vermilion, and I ran into jo Donald Choza, I was directed to him. And that was the most amazing experience of this whole project, being with him as he walked me through his tribal lands and his family burial place, and he talked about the spirits and the water. And I, as I was going on, I was getting goosebumps and thinking, if I could have just one drop of that blood in me, I could understand and feel this like he is and have that attachment. And then he gave me two of the best pictures in the show. I, I call them that because... And you mean the one where he's just standing with that look on his face? with his eyes closed and a, 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 and a look of serenity that I didn't ask for. And I, certainly it's, also, it's an anathema for a photographer for the eyes to be closed if you don't plan on it. And when I first looked at the negative and said most of this was shot on film, 
you know, with a loop. It's like, oh my God, his eyes are closed. And then I printed it. I said, oh my God, that's beautiful. Because it really conveyed the spirit he was inviting in me that I understood but could never be part of. Beyond those photographs that you were just explaining, do you have another one or two that are favorites? <laughs> you know, I really like this show. It's a package deal, you might say. But I guess some things, you know, it's, sometimes it's the personal experience that happened, not the power of the picture. And I'm always, you know, caught up in that, and that a viewer wouldn't know what happened when I was taking the picture, how that happened to happen, you know. But there's so many gifts, like Donald Choza. I, I do like the one of the panorama of the uh, housing development on the pit of the mine because, uh, you know, as mining began, towns would spring up next to them, and sooner or later, the towns would disappear because, they, be, as one guy said, the towns became a hole in the ground. Or in the case of Hibbing, they moved the entire town south, had to destroy some buildings. They built them the most beautiful high school in the world, which that picture attests to, uh, and, and the, uh, the city council or city hall was beautiful too. But, uh, and here, what you're seeing here is the towns retaking the mine. And, and they're paying for the view, you might say, because there's a picture next to it, which is off of one of the patios. It's a, they call it their little Grand Canyon. And, and so that, that speaks a lot to that cycle of development as the mining began and the towns would come up and then the towns would disappear and then the mines would play out and the towns come back. People who come see this exhibit, what do you want them to walk away with? I want them to realize what the range is, the beauty of the range and the, the, that historic content that it has, how historic it is for us, maybe even more important than the milling industry that we all hear about here in Minneapolis, but we ignore up north. We feel, oh, it's depressed. The people have left, haven't they? And it's the most vibrant area. And I wanted the pictures to capture that. And I think it does. I feel very proud of this project. I feel uh, proud that I was allowed to do it. I call it that sometimes when, it's, when you see such an amazing series of photographs standing in front of you and there's no other photographer in front of you. <laughs> I said, where is everybody? So I did it and took my time and really enjoyed myself. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.